We've all been in the situation where we've been sitting in a chair. It may be as we're flying somewhere. It may be in a theater, may even have been in a school classroom, and somebody started to kick us in the back of our chair. And they kick, they kick, and they don't stop. Well, the story is told about a crowded airliner. There is no seat left on this plane. And there was at the front of the plane by the bulkhead, just in front of the bulkhead, a kid, little kid who was just having a tantrum. His mom had tried to put his seatbelt on, but he was having none of it. And he was fussing, he was flailing his arms around, he was kicking the seat in front of him, and then he started to, to scream. Well, it was getting crazy. The mom tried to, to try and, and get her son calmed down, but it wasn't happening. And you could see people all around were starting to get agitated at, at this kerfuffle that was going on. And from the back of the plane came this very smart-looking old gentleman. He had white hair, and he was wearing the uniform of an Air Force general. He came down from the back of the plane, and he came up to where this commotion was going on. And he looked at the mom, and he held his hand up and said, Can I have a go, ma'am? She was so frustrated, she said, Sure. The kids seeing this sophisticated general in this uniform, it kind of caught him off guard and he, he stopped a moment and the general motioned to him, son, come here. And the kid leaned in and he pointed at the different things on his chest. And then all of a sudden the kid sat back in his chair, he went to his seat belt and he put it on and then he sat calmly. The mom gave this great big smile and said, thank you. And as the general started to walk back to his seat, the airplane started to applaud him. And as he was about to, to sit down in his chair, one of the flight attendants touched him on the, the cuff and said, Sir, I'd just like to know, can you just tell me, what did you say to him? Well, the general confided in her, Well, I just showed my battle stripes, I showed him my medals, and I told him as I pointed to the stars on my shoulders that as an Air Force general, one of the privileges that I had was that I can select any person flying on any plane to be taken off at any time. <laughs> when do you get angry? What is it that makes you get angry? Is it the small things? Is it the traffic jams? Is it something like waiting in the line in the grocery store? What are the kind of things that make you angry? Is it when somebody says something to you and you just think it's totally out of order and it just makes you want to explode? Is it when people don't give you the attention that you feel that you deserve at that time? Or you, and what happens where, when you get angry? Are you shorter with people? Do you say mean things? Are you subtle about it? You give people the cold shoulder or the evil eye. Or do you go on Facebook and just say how much of a jerk this person was because of the behavior and you just post all of it on your page? One of the things that is a reality in life is that we can't avoid dealing with our anger. 
But before we consider what the Bible says about anger, let's just take a moment to define anger. Anger is your God-given capacity to respond to a wrong that you think is important. And anger always expresses itself. It expresses itself in two ways. It identifies something in your world that matters to you, and it proclaims that you believe that something is wrong. Now, this could be something as, as little as waiting in a restaurant and then being served cold food, or it could be something major like a betrayal, a betrayal of confidence where you really feel let down. One difference between my anger and your anger and God's anger is that we're not perfect. I often get angry about things that I shouldn't or about things that don't really matter to anyone but me. But let's face it, often we're right to get angry because we're experiencing a true wrong, because there is injustices and wrongs that we face in our lives. But how should we express this anger when we feel it? Has anyone ever said to you, you know, talk to the hand because the face isn't listening? You know, do they give you the cold eye? or the cold shoulder. Because we're not perfect, you know, we, we respond um, with our anger in ways that just, to be frank, they're not helpful. <laughs> we let it out, we have a, a bit of a tantrum, we blow up, we gossip, we hold a grudge, we shut people out, we seek to get even. In fact, some of us are our, our most creative when we're getting even with other people and, and thinking about how we can actually do that. Let's take a look at what the Bible says about anger. Now, in the Old Testament reading that we had, we had a verse from the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is one of my favorite books because it, it's so practical. It says so much about how, to, how we can live our lives. Um, Billy Graham has said that every day he reads the Proverbs and he, he reads the Psalms, the Psalms and the Proverbs. And I love his reason for it. He said that he reads the Proverbs so he knows how he needs to treat God and worship God. And then he reads the Proverbs to learn how to treat people. And you know, that's what the Proverbs is, is all there for. And it gives us a, a lot of wisdom on anger, how to deal with it, how it, what it looks like. And I'm going to read three verses that I think really sum up pretty well its teaching on the result of anger. So Proverbs 19.19, 19, this is something we looked at earlier. A man of great anger shall bear the penalty, for if you rescue him, you will only have to do it again. That's the reality. And then the next one, Proverbs 14, 29 to 30. He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered displays great foolishness. A tranquil heart is life to the body, but passion is rottenness to the bones. A businessman had lost his temper over a project and there was an important meeting that he had to attend. And he was so busy and so irate about what had happened um, that he left his office um, to go to this appointment and he left his cell phone behind. And so he didn't have directions to this meeting. And he thought, I know how to, to get there. I think I've got an idea. And he said, I haven't got enough time to go back and get my directions out. I'll, I'll just go along with it. And so he drove and 
to cut a long story short, he got thoroughly lost. And not having his Google Maps to resort to, he thought, I'm going to have to ask somebody. And he was driving, and he didn't see anyone. And then he came upon this, this young lad. He pulled up his car to, at the side of, of the, the road at the sidewalk um, to ask this young kid for directions. And he said, hey, which way to Woodland Hills? The kid said, I don't know, a little embarrassed. Well, then the man demanded, what about um, Van Nuys? Do you know where Van Nuys? Which way, how far to, to Van Nuys? And the kid said, I don't know that either. And the man said to, to the kid, is there anyone around here who can give me directions, who can help me to get to Woodland Hills? And the kid shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know. Well, the man was absolutely getting annoyed with the, this kid who was keep on saying the same thing to his answers. I don't know. And so he, he, the tone of his voice got really irate. And he lost it and he just looked at the, the kid and he said, well, you don't know much, do you? And then for the first time, the kid looked back and he smiled. And he said to him, no, but I'm not lost. <laughs> you know, Proverbs tells us that a quick temper, it gets us into trouble. Can you touch the person next to you and say, your quick temper gets you into trouble? Can you do that? This is a reality. Our quick temper has the, has the evolution possibility to get us into, into trouble. Um, it, it just does. It gets us into that situation. Actually, that last proverb that we read, and it's a beautiful proverb, this is a good one to remember. He who is slow to anger has great understanding. Probably some of us, the people who we admire the most, the people that we look to as wise people, they're the people who are slow to get riled by something. You know, they're quite measured. They seem like they're in control of a, of a situation. The proverb says, he who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick tempered displays great foolishness. Now, the, the Hebrew word for quick tempered here, which is the word katser, it means to, to be short of breath or wind. Um, it's the word, it, it would be katser ruach. I don't recommend you to say that. Um, out loud. Um, but, but basically, it's the same word that we get there for wind as, as the word or breath that is, is the spirit um, of God in the Old Testament, that word ruach, which is used in reference, reference to the spirit of God throughout the Old Testament. We might conclude that the person who is short of the spirit operates under their own power. They're vulnerable to frustration and temper. But the person filled with the Spirit, perhaps they're a bit more measured. Perhaps they'll exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, characterized there so wonderfully by Paul in Galatians 5 as peace, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control. Now, the second point that is highlighted here um, in the book of Proverbs that I'd like to bring to your attention. It's found in Proverbs 14, verse 17. Short-tempered people make stupid mistakes, and schemers are hated. So it says, a quick temper leads to mistakes. When we react to something, when we're reactors rather than acting, actors, when we react to situations rather than being in control, when we have a quick temper, knee-jerk reaction, sometimes not only do we get ourselves into trouble, it leads to mistakes. The story is told of a Sabbath school teacher who was, she was notorious for having a, a quick temper. 
And she was trying to make the point um, to the kids in the classroom that good Christians don't keep their faith a secret. And she was, you know, impressively marching back and forth in front of her kids, telling them. And she asked, now class, why do you think people call me a Christian? And the room went silent for a moment. Then one of the boys of the, bat of the class slowly lifted up his hand and he said, is it because they don't know you? <laughs> you know, the, the Hebrew word for temper, um, it literally means nostrils. Now, I love this, implying the flaring of the nostrils. You know, when we get mad sometimes, well, I'm not going to say any more. Um, but I, I love how colorful this word is. Um, because it's been rightly said that when your temper boils over, you usually end up in hot water. You know, that, that's just the reality um, of the, the situation. And we've seen it over and over again in our lives. In fact, researchers tell us that between 75 to 90% of all doctor's office visits, what are they for? Well, stress-related issues. Um, ultimately is, is what they say. And if you take a look at this image, you know, you have a good idea um, what stress actually does to our bodies. Um, the head, you know, it, it causes issues with mood, anger, depression, um, sadness, a lack of energy. Sometimes our skin breaks out. Sometimes we have aches and pains in our joints and mus muscles. Um, our heart pressure can go up. All of these different things, stress affects our bodies in, in a really, really crazy way. Controlling one's temper keeps mind and body functioning well. But when the kettle boils over, it overflows on it, its own sides. Um, I love Proverbs 16.32. It says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. So what we've read in all of these verses that we've read this morning is that anger is a powerful emotion. It has the, the potential to hurt people. It has the potential even to hurt us if we don't express it well, if we don't deal with it in a right way or, or a better way. Anger brings issues with it. Yet scriptures like this tell us that with deliberate control, anger can actually become a constructive force for relational growth and understanding. It, it can actually be used to do something that can be really, really helpful. So the question uh, arises here. How can you get the best of your anger? Well, I think a good place to, to start is to actually ask ourselves the question, what's behind it? Why am I angry about this certain situation? What is it that is causing me to react like this, to express myself in this way? What about this issue that is important to me has caused me to respond and my heart rate to, to, my heart to beat faster and to feel burdened by it? I came across this as I was doing a, a Google search, um, and it's Calvin and Hobbes. God put me on this earth to accomplish a certain number of things. Right now, I'm so far behind, I'll never die. You know, when we get angry, most of the time, we're taking God's place. Hear me out on this. When, when we get angry, we're taking upon ourselves a responsibility that isn't ours anyway. We're taking upon ourselves a, a responsibility which is probably God's alone. We're taking back the reins from God. So how can we get the best of our anger? 
Well, I think Paul gives us a great solution in the, the New Testament. And in some respects, it's pretty obvious, but in other respects, it, it's very hard and perhaps it's unlikely to us. And he gives us an explanation in Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 29. This is what he says. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, getting even. Be kind and compassion to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul encourages us as believers to follow God's example. If we're to get the best of our anger, if you're to get the best of your anger, Paul says, seek to follow God's example. Well, what is God's example here? How does God respond when something important in his world is wrong? What does God do about it? Well, something that we see time and time again in the scriptures, and, and Paul actually puts it in black and white um, in Ephesians, is that God responds redemptively. God's anger is redemptive. You know, some of us may take issue with the idea, does God really get angry? Well, I would say yes. But let's take a moment to, to think about how God expresses his anger. Paul tells us that there in Ephesians 5 verse 2, he took on the form of a servant. He entered into our world as the person of Jesus. And Jesus came to our broken world to be broken on the cross for us. That was his act of being redemptive with our sin problem. And our anger can also result in redemption. When we are angry, we can learn to say, that's wrong, without ranting, without slamming doors, without kicking things, without exaggerating what happened or calling someone names, or cursing, or hating. For some of us, it might be good to do physical things to let out that anger. Um, but when we're doing it at people, or towards people, this is where it can become unhealthy. In this passage, you know, Paul gives us a, a model of how to express our anger constructively. Let's read again, verse 31. He said, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. So Paul tells us first, he says, get rid of all bitterness. He says, we're not to, to brood. We're not to think up ways about getting back and using our creativity, as I said earlier. But we're to think um, differently to, towards that. Um, I think, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is my experience, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. You know, there's been many times in, in my life, and I'm sure there has been in yours, where I've been kept to sleep at night. That didn't make sense. I wish I had been kept to sleep. I haven't been able to, to go to sleep or I've woken up in the night. I've awoken because of something that somebody's said, 
or done or something that has just got under my skin and I want to throttle them, you know, I want to kill them, figuratively speaking, you know, because of, of what they've done. And it's normally because of what they've done to somebody that I care about, um, you know, and, you know, those, I think, mama tiger mothers, when we see, you know, we see our kids get hurt, we want to come to their, and fathers, there's just something that gets under our skin. You know, envy rots the bones, anger rots the bones. Unless we deal with that, it really impacts us in a very physical way. The second thing he says, verse 31, get rid of your rage and anger. He tells us to, to deal with it. Right in this verse, um, he doesn't tell us how. He will do in a minute. But he says when we are feeling that rage, we are angered. We need to find a way of compensating, of dealing with these emotions, these feelings that have arisen. And then finally, he says that we, we shouldn't go to others who aren't involved in gossip. He says, we shouldn't post on Facebook how someone was being a jerk. He actually says, get rid of your brawling and slander. He suggests that we follow God's example. So what's God's example in this passage? Well, we've already said that God's anger is redemptive. Paul says God is patient. Now, this word patient, patient literally means to be slow to anger, to, to slow down, to be patient. Paul says God is merciful. Mercy is a word that we don't use too often in our, our common vernacular. But mercy is a way of looking at something. It's a way of looking at something that is really wrong and saying, I'm going to tackle that to make it better. It's to deal with something constructively. Paul says God is forgiving. God's forgiveness doesn't make what was wrong okay. And this is a big thing about forgiveness. You know, um, We've seen some uh, amazing um, examples of forgiveness um, in the last couple of months with the shooting there in Charlottesville, I mean, Charleston, excuse me, um, at the AME church there where nine human beings, you know, were innocently, their lives taken away from them. And you saw interviewed on, on CNN, on MSNBC, on Fox News, you know, these family members saying, we forgive him. You know, you, you remember hearing the story a number of years ago of a similar incident with the Amish community, um, where the, I believe there were 12 people involved. And, that community came around the, the wife of the, the shooter and they organized his funeral and they ministered to her. And they said, when they were asked, you know, why are you forgiving this man who did such a, you know, a horrible thing? The answer was because Jesus tells us we have to forgive. Forgiveness is never easy. It costs us something. But you know, forgiveness, in my experience, has been a better option than letting that grudge fester and letting the emotion that I feel against somebody, you know, dominate me. Um, and I think that's what Paul is, is getting at here. God's forgiveness doesn't make what was wrong okay. He names what is wrong and deals with the wrong by paying the price himself. And then finally, God confronts 
in love. You see, there is a place for a right kind of anger. An anger that is righteous. We've all heard of righteous anger. Uh, an anger that has a purpose which is loving. And because God lovingly confronts by his grace, so can we. We can do that. And I believe that in giving us this model of how to express our anger constructively, ultimately Paul is saying to us that it is possible to get the best of your anger. But I believe it takes humility to do so. Now let's go back to something we said a little earlier. Whenever we're angry about something, our anger expresses something that matters, something that is wrong. Our anger is a God-created um, emotion response to these things. Being angry about things is normal. But as Christians, we have the responsibility to use our anger redemptively. And that takes humility. Sometimes it means resigning as the CEO of the universe and saying, you know, I'm going to have to let God be the justifier on this. I can't do it. Or acknowledging that this is a bit where we claim the promise Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But somehow we turn this over to God. Being humble takes our willingness to follow God's ways, to follow these steps. And it takes our willingness ultimately to be mastered by Jesus. It takes our willingness to imitate God and his ways, actually fundamentally recognizing that his ways are ultimately the best. That they will, even though they feel hard to do, it is the best way to live our lives, even when it's hard to see in the short term. In closing, I'd like to read something that... Um, I'd like to share with you something that I read recently which um, touched my heart. In December 1806, shortly before his death, John Newton, who wrote you know, the wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, he suffered um, a sickness and he was, his eyes and ears um, were fading. And I read that in his diary, he recorded a prayer asking God to help him end well. And this is what he wrote. Oh, for grace to meet the approach of death with a humble, thankful, resigned spirit becoming my profession, that I may not stain my character by impatience, jealousy, or any hateful temper, but may be prepared and permitted to depart in peace and hope and be enabled. If I can speak to bear my testimony to thy faithfulness and goodness with my last breath. I mean, what a, what a, a prayer to be permitted to be, depart in peace and hope and be enabled if I can speak to bear my testimony to thy faithfulness and goodness with my last breath. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I want to claim some of those words for myself, that, that my life is defined by some of these things. Um, I don't want anger to get the best of me in my life. I don't want my temper to affect those around me or hurt those around me. I want to get the best of that stuff. You know, there's a friend of um, John Newton who saw him on his deathbed. And Newton's friend wrote this. I saw Mr. Newton near the closing scene. 
He was hardly able to talk. And all I find I noted down upon my leaving him was thus. John Newton said, My memory is nearly gone, but I can remember two things. That I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. And I believe that remembering how good God is helps us to get the best of our anger. When I recognize that God has been patient with me and gracious to me and merciful to me, I have a responsibility to be gracious to you, to be merciful to you, to be forgiving of you. That's just the way it works. May God be with us all as we seek to follow him and get the best of our anger. God be with you. Amen.